This review has been designed to help prepare for the biology keystone exam. There are nine different podcasts that will be provided. Each of the nine podcasts covers different important topics in biology. The first podcast topic will be all about biochemistry and covers the following packet questions. Start off with, we have different compounds in biology and we're going to break them into two groupings. We have organic compounds and we have inorganic compounds. Our organic compounds are those compounds that contain both carbon and hydrogen in them. We are going to focus mainly on four different categories of organic compounds. Those will be our carbohydrates, our lipids, our nucleic acids, and proteins. In addition, we'll discuss one major important inorganic compound for this section. And inorganic compounds do not contain both carbon and hydrogen. For example, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. For this podcast, the most important inorganic topic we're going to focus on is water. So just a refresher for chemistry, we have water consisting of two hydrogens and an oxygen atom. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. 8 protons, 8 electrons is a neutral atom, has 8 neutrons also in the nucleus. The first shell can hold up to 2 electrons, and then each subsequent shell can hold up to 8. So oxygen is 8 electrons, 2 in the first shell, 6 in the following one. Hydrogen has an atomic number of 1, 1 proton, 1 electron, and actually has no neutrons in its nucleus. That's why they're showing you with a little plus sign here. Because this is looking at the first shell, it wants to do whatever it can to get to 2. Atoms will steal, atoms will share, and atoms will dump off electrons to guide to get to their magic numbers. So what happens here is we have sharing between the two hydrogens and the oxygen, which results in something like this. You can see from the green, we're sharing one electron, and then oxygen sharing one, so hydrogen's got its two, it's happy. This hydrogen has its two, it's happy. And then we have two, four, six, eight electrons in oxygen's outer shell, oxygen's also happy. However, even though they're sharing the electrons, they don't share them as evenly as you might think. Electrons are negatively charged, and the whole opposites attract thing is true. Electrons want to go to the area that has more of a positive charge. So if you're looking at hydrogen, well, hydrogen has one little proton in its nucleus, whereas oxygen has eight protons in its nucleus. So what happens is even though they're shared, they're not as evenly shared as possible. So if you look at this picture, they have a slight little negative here and a slight little positive here saying, well, this part of the water molecule is more negative and this part of the water molecule is more positive. We have a term for that and we call it polarity. So water is a perfect example of a polar molecule, slight negative and slight positive. However, there are nonpolar molecules due to either the elements that make them up or it might be due to the actual spatial arrangement of those elements. So ethane, for example, is nonpolar. It has an even distribution of electrons all about it. The reason that I'm even mentioning this is because this polarity in water is really, really important because we need to talk about hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds form whenever there's a slight positive and a slight negative. It's not as strong as a real bond, like a covalent or ionic bond, but it is an attraction between these molecules and compounds. So you can see right here, they're represented by dashed lines to indicate they're weak. But if you're thinking about a whole beaker of water or an entire strand of DNA, they build in strength due to their sheer numbers. So you can see here is just another picture, water molecules trying to hydrogen bond, and you can have more than one bond forming. Liquids, at least in, for water, don't tend to arrange themselves as neatly with hydrogen bonds, which is pretty interesting because most compounds when they are in their solid state, they are actually more dense. They're more clumped together than they are in the liquid state. In most compounds, they will sink as a solid compared to the other one. They're just more dense. Water, however, is an exception. You've seen that water is denser because ice floats on top of the water. And the reason that happens is when ice freezes, it spaces out to maximize the number of hydrogen bonds. So here you might get one or two hydrogen bonds. Here we are getting that maximum number of hydrogen bonds occurring between water molecules. So what happens is they space out to get that perfect arrangement, and then when they're spaced out, they're less dense. This is really important for aquatic ecosystems, because if you think of animals, Certain animals will actually still live in a lake even in the middle of winter because it's only the top layer of ice that freezes and since ice is less dense, it stays on the top. Two interesting properties that come out of this hydrogen bonding, at least with water, are cohesion and adhesion. So co is referring to together. So this is when 
water molecules are hydrogen bonded specifically to other water molecules. And you can see this is beating up here. And you can see this kind of idea of the surface tension of the water. With cohesion, we have this nice little dome or this bubble here trying to show you that the hydrogen bonds help pull the water back onto itself and that's what creates that beating effect. It's also important in organisms here they're showing you well the way that water gets from the roots to the very tippy top of the tree is through this cohesion. We also have adhesion, which is when water molecules hydrogen bond to other compounds. So the most common example that you guys have probably seen is the idea of a meniscus. And if you're measuring something in a graduated cylinder in class, you know to read from the bottom of the meniscus. The reason the meniscus even forms in the first place is because water wants to try to form hydrogen bonds with the hydrophobic sur or hydrophilic surfaces. Glass is hydrophilic, water is going to hydrogen bond up the sides of it, and the skinnier the tube, the more you're going to see that pulling up occurring. It also is really important, again, just another example with plants, the idea that water molecules are able to kind of pull themselves up or pull themselves down along the sides of these teeny tiny tubes inside of plants to get fluid moving throughout the whole plant. We have polymerization, which is actually not related to Yu-Gi-Oh in this case, but polymerization is the idea of taking a monomer and you can see it's bracketed off here. It's this little building block, this unit, and attaching it over and over again to make a large chunk of these, which we call a polymer. Now, a monomer can be identical, so I can have this exact same thing repeating over and over again, or monomers can be different looking as long as they have the right parts match up, and I'll kind of show you that in a second. So I mentioned those macromolecules as our organic compounds, and macromolecules can either be built and we can form them, or we can break them down and use the elements in them for other types of molecules or compounds in our body. If we build them up, we call that an anabolic process, and the general umbrella term for that is polymerization. There are two more specific terms that explain exactly how polymerations happen, and I'm really going to be focusing on the bottom one, because for me, that term makes a lot of sense. You're dehydrated, well then that means you've lost water, and synthesis means to put something together. So in a nutshell, dehydration synthesis means you remove a molecule of water to create a chemical bond. If I want to break something down, it's not an anabolic process, it's a catabolic process. And instead of polymerization, we have depolymerization. There's one specific term for this, and this is hydrolysis. And I love this word because hydro, referring to water, lysis, referring to split. In this case, we're actually going to add water across a chemical bond, and when we add that water, we break the bond in half. So we can go from a big thing, a polymer, and we can break it into small repeating units or monomers. So just a little bit on dehydration synthesis, that's the overview, so you can see here the monomer comes close, an enzyme comes in, takes away the water, removes water, and makes a chemical bond. This is just a very general picture, but it's done with carbohydrates, it's done with lipids, and it's done with proteins. And you can see right here, it's pulled out the water to make the bond, pulling out the water to make the bond. On the flip side, we have hydrolysis. So again, we're going to add water using an enzyme across a bond, and that's going to split it up. So water added, split apart. Here, the water would have been added, OH and your H, splitting it apart, OH and H, splitting it apart. We have four different macromolecules. We're going to cover carbs, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. They all have slightly different elements in them, but you'll notice they all share carbon and hydrogen because that's what makes them an organic compound. The way I remember the elements is by thinking of the Power Rangers. Sounds a little cheesy, but the Power Rangers have their little catchy theme song. But instead of saying, go, go, Power Rangers, I say, cho, cho, chop, and chosen for the different elements that are in there. I'm going to first talk about carbohydrates. They have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. And the carbohydrate is carbon and water. So it actually ends up being a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of those elements. When you're looking at carbohydrates, they end in O-S-E, glucose, fructose, sucrose, galactose, lactose, all those kind of sugars. 
what you can see here is they can either form a linear form or a ring. But again, if I were to count up all these carbons and count up all these carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, I'd still get that one to two to one ratio. Our monomers, our teeny repeating units, is actually this hexagonal structure here. We call it a monosaccharide. It means one sugar or one sweet. If I add a whole bunch of them together in repeating units, we call it a polysaccharide, which is a polymer, and it means many sugars. You can see that they're not all attached exactly the same way, but they all go through dehydration synthesis. Carbs are used as your main source of energy and your quickest source of energy. If you're running, you're going to first tap into your carb supply, break those down to get some ATP. It's not until later on that you would go to your lipids. So lipids are CHO with not a lot of O. There's a much higher number of carbons and hydrogens than oxygen. So this squiggly zigzag tail you see over here, that's actually a carbon and two hydrogens at each little corner point here. Typically, they're going to end in OL, so glycerol is one of your good examples. The monomers are actually two different ones. So you have your fatty acids, which is this long chain bit, and then you have your glycerol, which is shown in red. Some people have heard of trans fatty acids before, and a lot of companies have pretty much eliminated them. And there's also saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. So I just kind of wanted to go over those really quickly. Saturated means you're holding the maximum amount of something. So a saturated fatty acid has as many hydrogens as it can shove on that tail. As a result, it tends to be pretty straight or linear. An unsaturated fatty acid is not saturated. So you can see right here and here it's missing those hydrogens. As a result, it tends to get a kink in it. This would be like animal fat, lard, butter, solid at room temperature. This would be more of your plant oils liquid at room temperature. And again, we're using this for our long-term energy storage. I also put CM here because lipids are the main component of cell membranes. And we're going to talk about cells and their components in future podcasts. Our nucleic acids are chopping, and when you're thinking of those, you want to think about DNA and RNA. The monomer is called a nucleotide, and it looks like this. There are three different parts of it. We have a five-carbon sugar, and that's slightly different, and I'll talk about that in a future podcast. We have a phosphate group, that's where the P comes from, and we have a nitrogenous base. There are four different types of nitrogenous bases in DNA, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and a slightly different one for RNA. When you look at DNA, it's actually a very complex structure once we start adding in all the different elements that make it up. The function of DNA is to store genetic information. So your hair color, the things that you inherit from your parents, disease susceptibility, your height, all that is stored in these little elements, these A's, these T's, these G's and C's, in these monomers to pass down from generation to generation. And this brings us to our last of our macromolecules. That would be our proteins. Proteins are the largest. They can be up to hundreds of thousands of Daltons. And they are very large compounds, and they're really important for our body. I put the blue in S for chosen because not every single protein is going to necessarily contain sulfur. However, it's very commonly found and helps with the shaping, so I include it. Proteins, such as enzymes, tend to end in ACE. You have hydrolase, lipase, catalase, and sometimes they end in IN, like thrombin. An amino acid is the monomer of a protein, and it's made of three different parts. It looks like this. So you have an amine or an amino group right here, and you have a carboxyl or acid group right here. That's where amino acid comes from. The top half of this is exactly the same for every single amino acid. It's this part shown here in yellow, this R group that's different. There are 20 different naturally occurring amino acids. They all share the top. It's this R part that's different for each of the 20. When we look at our proteins, they are our enzymes. I'm going to talk about enzymes in a second. And proteins are important for structure, like your muscles. So you can see right here, a protein is a bunch of these little monomers, these amino acids, joined together. And then what happens through hydrogen bonding, they are able to form more complex shapes. Also in DNA, the thing that holds it together in the center, hydrogen bonding, very important for organisms. And you can see here that proteins continue to twist and fold up to change their shape. Enzymes are so important for our body because if we didn't have them, no chemical reactions would ever happen. The problem is that chemical reactions usually require a lot of energy. We'd either have to heat up our body so much we'd cook it, or we'd have to wait years and years for processes to form that we would drop dead. What enzymes do is they take that massive amount of energy we would need, and they cut it down to a much more manageable amount that's doable in our body.
The way that enzymes work is sometimes referred to as a lock and key or induced fit model because it's all about the shape. So I have my reactant or my substrate and what it does is it snuggles up in here to just the right shape. If the pieces don't fit together, then that reaction is not going to happen. In this case, they do fit together. So what happens is it lowers the activation energy, the shape is changed, the reaction is carried out, and then those products are released. So if you were eating a cheeseburger and you were digesting that bread in your body, there would be an enzyme that would take that huge polysaccharide and chop it down into all the little monomers. Enzymes, however, are very susceptible to changes in your body or changes in their environment. Temperature is a huge one. One of the reasons that you can't get fevers too high without causing damage to your body is because they will mess up your enzymes. Both temperature and pH affect how hydrogen bonds in your body work. And since hydrogen bonds are so important for the shape of this guy, if you're messing with those, you're going to affect the shape, then the reaction won't happen, and the organism will ultimately die. And also, other enzymes can factor in. Sometimes they might change the shape. They might block the spot. They might, in fact, destroy another enzyme. So all those things affect how enzymes work in our body. So to sum up this first podcast, we have water as a polar molecule, and it's really important, those hydrogen bondings, not just in water, but in a lot of compounds for living organisms. We have our macromolecules that can be built up through polymerization or broken down through depolymerization, and we have our carbohydrates, our lipids, our nucleic acids, and our proteins that all do important things in our body. Thank you for watching this first podcast.